Well, it is officially the afternoon, so it is time for us to get started. So welcome to the Austin Hems Lunch and Learn series. And just one quick announcement before we get started. Mark your calendars for the evening of November 2nd. We are hosting our second annual Top Golf event. The first one was such a great success, and we will we hope that you can join us again this year. So be on the lookout with your email and on social media on how to register. Also, if we have anyone that's interested in sponsoring this event, please let me know. So on to our October Lunch and Learn. Our speaker today is Nora Belcher, Executive Director of Texas eHealth Alliance. Nora is regarded as one of the most knowledgeable and effective healthcare advocates in Texas and beyond. She spent five years in the Texas Capitol helping shape healthcare policy, representing then Governor Rick Perry, in collaborative conversations with legislators, private sector health care, and Texas Health and Human Services Commission. Today's topic is looking forward to the future of health IT, or, or HIT. Um, the healthcare ecosystem has gone through an enormous evolution over the last decade. The end of 2021 marks 12 years after the passage of the High Tech Act, five years after the passage of the 21st Century Cures Act, and if that's not enough, we're moving to our third year of COVID-19 pandemic response. Healthcare is a highly regulated industry in the best of times, and stakeholders are dealing with a rapid pace of regulatory and reimbursement changes, coupled with the constantly accelerating speed of innovations in the market. So what does this all mean? Today, Nora is going to review the impact of these changes on the healthcare system and provide us some insights and observations about what that means for the future of healthcare. So with, without further ado, Nora, thank you so much, and I'll leave it to you. Thank you, Erica. And as always, it's such an honor to uh, be at a, an awesome HIMSS chapter event. This is my home HIMSS chapter. So um, some of you I know, some of you I don't. All of you I'm delighted to be a part of. Um, I want to start with a little bit more of, of my background, just because I think for those of you that don't know me, context for presenters is important. I've been at this a really long time, um, and I found a picture recently that I wanted to share with everybody. Uh, this is me as a sixth grader. I think I won a computer programming contest in basic. I could make a ball bounce around the screen faster and better than anyone else in my grade. So I consider myself to be a digital native. I've been using technology for as long as I can remember. And I'm a big believer in technology and the power of technology to really make things better um, in the healthcare system. For those of you that might not be familiar with the Texas eHealth Alliance, it's our goal to improve the healthcare system for patients using health information technology. We're a 501c6 nonprofit, which means we're a trade association. Part of what that also means is that I can't endorse, recommend specific products or companies. That's an antitrust violation. We actually provide a venue for competitors to come together and talk about relevant public policy topics. And when you do that, you have to leave individual business planning and strategy outside of the room. In talking to Hope Young, to get ready to talk to everybody today, Hope was really encouraging me to sort of look down the road. I do a lot of legislative recaps, and I'm going to do a little bit of that with you here today because it is important to kind of see what's happened there, what's going on. I want to go a little bit of a reminder into the federal changes that we're all coping with and some of the downstream implications. And then I want to talk about what is within our reach as we move forward. So um, I grew up doing speech and debate. And so the rule of three, you want to have three concepts for your audience. And I like that I've got three R's here. I've got three R's for telemedicine that some of you may have heard us talk about. We're going to recap, we're going to do some reminding. And then really the need of this for me today is talking to you about what's within our reach. Where are we going? What does that look like? What questions do we still have on the table? Um, I will be checking the Q&A. So um, feel free to use the Q&A function um, to ask uh, to, to ask me questions and I'll, I'll get to them as I can either during the presentation or we'll, I'm going to try to leave some time at the end um, for that. So that's the game plan for the next uh, little bit. So to recap, I'm going to start with our recap. I'm going to talk a little bit about the legislative landscape. We had a lot of activity this session in three parallel buckets. Uh, telemedicine, 
broadband and then issues around data and privacy. So I'm going to spend just a little bit of time on each of those topics, highlight some of the things that happened. I'm also going to talk about some of the things that didn't happen because that is important for everybody to have on their radar screen as well. Um, the legislature does make public policy statements by, by not doing things sometimes just as often as they make them by doing things. So let's start with telemedicine. Most of you are probably aware that when the public health emergency started, the Texas Health and Human Services Commission created a lot of telemedicine and telehealth flexibility. And what this meant was making it sort of very, very clear that you could use virtual care to deliver Medicaid services in settings that would not have traditionally been thought of as appropriate for telemedicine and telehealth. Those flexibilities were very, very successful but it was also really stressful for our providers and our patients because they were being renewed every 30 days. So at the end of every month, my phone would start to ring. Are they gonna renew the flexibilities? Are they gonna renew the flexibilities? And I would say, yes, yes, yes. We're still in a public health emergency. Do y'all remember those five minutes earlier this year when we thought we were done? That was exciting. That didn't happen. So we really wanted to provide through the legislative process continuity for patients and providers who've adopted these models in the programs that the government pays for. So that's Medicaid, children's health insurance program, children with special health care needs, the waivers under Medicaid, all that stuff. So in talking to stakeholders, we put together a package and we took it um, to be introduced by Representative For Price. And if you've ever heard me talk about the legislature, you can't avoid me talking about For Price. He's from West Texas. He's one of the big champions of telemedicine and telehealth. We were sponsored in the Senate by Dr. Don Beckingham, um, who also, it's really great to have a clinician, but a clinician and an attorney as my bill author and sponsor. That's a pretty good deal. Before I get into details, I want to tell y'all something that I hope brings a smile to everybody's face. The reason it is House Bill 4 is because the Speaker and Lieutenant Governor are able to basically give bills promotions. The budget is always SB1 or HB1 in a regular session. Bills are numbered as they get filed, but those really low bill numbers are for priorities of the speaker and the lieutenant governor. So our new speaker, Dave Phelan, took this bill. It was actually House Bill 974, and he promoted it to House Bill 4. That gave us visibility. Um, it signaled that we were a priority bill for the speaker. Um, it was the lowest numbered telemedicine and telehealth bill that's ever made its way through the Texas legislature and outside of the budget, the lowest numbered bill I've ever worked on. I've worked on a five, a six, and a 10. So this was a huge deal. And I'm really grateful to the speaker and his leadership team that they recognized the importance of getting this work done. And they were very supportive as was uh, the Lieutenant Governor and the Senate. Procedurally, I also want to mention that this was a bill that did not get a vote against it at any point in the legislative cycle, not in committee and not on the floor of either chamber. The most concern that we heard uh, was from Scientology, who, who just doesn't like American healthcare in general and, and had some concerns that the stuff might be abused, but at the end of the day, they didn't even oppose the bill. So I say that to say to everyone on this call, I understand that politics in the Capitol feels hyper-partisan right now. This was an issue that literally everybody came together and rallied around during session. And it was really great to see that there were still things that Democrats and Republicans could agree on. We had Democrats as uh, joint authors in both chambers. We had a lot of bipartisan consensus and that was really nice. So what does it do really quickly? Basically it lets those flexibilities stay in place. It, continues audio only behavioral health. So this is the use of telephone calls instead of video calls. We still have lots of Medicaid clients that don't have access to broadband. I'll talk about that some more here in a minute. Um, we also wanted to expand the way that we use remote patient monitoring in the Medicaid program through our health plans. Because that would have been useful during the pandemic. Um, we didn't just do clinical, purely clinically facing stuff. One of the, the stories that I'll tell, and each of these provisions has human stories behind it. I could spend an hour just telling you the stories I heard from providers and patients about how this made a difference. One of the things that happened though, last spring when everything shut down, we had patients who qualified for services who hadn't had an in-home assessment. We didn't really have a methodology for using an iPad and a video camera maybe to show a house to see if you need a wheelchair ramp, do you need bars in your shower, what do you need? We, we weren't able to do that. As a result, people who were qualified for services weren't getting them. 
So we worked that out for the public health emergency and we would like to continue to be able to do virtual home assessments when it's appropriate to make sure that once people get through the very difficult process of qualifying for Medicaid, that they get their services more quickly. So that was, that was a big deal. This actually happened to a family member of a friend of mine, uh, an individual with early onset dementia. It was very hard to qualify for her Medicaid. Uh, they found the family got her all the way through the process and the week she was supposed to have her home assessment was the week everything shut down. So she was left without services and um, that's really not acceptable. We really need to get people into the system and we need to get them taken care of. The last two things I'll mention that the bill did is the federal law changed around what we call network adequacy. So this is how we measure the strength of a provider panel inside a managed care plan for Medicaid. We wanna make sure telemedicine and telehealth are acknowledged in that process. We, we did find kind of a funky little quirk in the law um, that made it unclear as to whether our Medicaid health plans would send text messages to their enrollees. We wanted to clean that up because again, during the public health emergency, being able to text people would have been really handy. So really what this was, was an exercise in looking around, figuring out what worked, keeping the things that worked, and acknowledging, believe it or not, that not everything is appropriate to be done with virtual care. And that's a question I get a lot. So let me preemptively give you an example of something that's not appropriate. The American Academy of Pediatrics is very concerned about baby well checks that must be done in person. Because if you think about being in a virtual setting with your doctor, it's a conversation and you're telling them, my ear hurts, my head hurts, my head itches, my bone is healing. Babies can't talk. Um, and it's not to, in any way, shape or form, I'm a parent um, put down the capacity of parents to explain what's going on with the baby. But pediatricians are trained to look for things that civilians aren't. So the AAP says, yes, there are some parts of a well baby check you can do online, but you really need a pediatrician to put hands on that baby. That is the standard of care. That's what we want to uphold. So we passed household four. That was a big deal. People were very excited and also relieved of that every 30 day pressure of those flexibilities uh, being renewed. And this was just really well received by the legislature. Along those lines, we also looked around and said, okay, what other adjustments do we need to make? And I wanna highlight three more bills here really quickly. Senate Bill 40 made some changes for the professionals that are regulated by the Texas Department of Licensing and Regulation to make sure they could do telehealth and that was very clear in their statute. We also have joined something called the Interstate Medical Licensure Compact. So this is a way to expedite uh, physician licensing in other participating states. I think there's 32 or 33 states in this compact. It doesn't automatically grant you a full practice license, but it creates an administrative pathway to get licensed in multiple states. The driver behind this, I think this is so fascinating, was MD Anderson Cancer Center. We learned during session that a third of their patients live outside of Texas and it was gonna cost them $11 million to get all their doctors licensed in all the states they needed licenses for. Um, and that really helped us make a persuasive case that we should participate in the compact. You still have to have a Texas license in almost every scenario to do telemedicine and telehealth. We wanna make it a little easier for providers to get that. And then finally, I wanna spend just a minute on teledentistry uh, because I get a lot of questions about what the heck is a teledentistry and why should I care? There were three policy issues that really got exposed during the pandemic in the dental space that we needed to address. That remote practice for hygienists, which we resolved as part of the bill, they can do it under supervision. They don't have to have a dentist physically on site. Wanted to make sure it was a covered service. We wanted to make sure the standard of care remains the same, whether you're doing virtual dentistry or in-person dentistry. And the reason this is important, I'm gonna give another example because I think storytelling sometimes can really make things clear. Uh, those of you who know me may remember, I had braces when I was 45. I didn't just have braces, I had crossbite elastics because I had a misaligned jaw. During the public health emergency, the Texas State Board of Dental Examiners did not feel they had the authority to authorize the use of technology even in existing relationships. So my personal orthodontist was quite upset because you can overcorrect with rubber bands and she was told she couldn't even look at a photo or a video of her patients mouths to see if their teeth were lining up to tell them to take the rubber bands off. So it just wasn't very clear. Um, there's also quite a bit of um, headbutting over direct to consumer orthodontia, companies like Invisalign and Smile Direct Club, and how does that interface with traditional orthodontics? 
um, and I think this was a consensus bill. Everybody agreed the standard of care needs to be the same. The board needs to have the authority to regulate. Um, and this was an issue that, that kind of fell apart, didn't get resolved in 2019, and we got it resolved this time. I also understand from talking to people in the industry that dentistry really took a hit last spring when we had to pause everything uh, from a revenue perspective. And so this is gonna allow dentists to offer some innovation and hopefully we never go back into lockdown, but I'd rather have the tools in place and never use them than not have the tools and have another public health emergency. And I think the legislators very much feel the same way. Um, I wanna talk about payment parity for a minute with a disclaimer which is that my association does not take a position on payment parity. It's an antitrust issue for us that we don't get into pricing of what people get paid for the use of our equipment. Um, during the early part of the public health emergency, there were a lot of mandates to pay telemedicine at parity, which means at the same rate as in person. That is already the law for Medicaid in fee-for-service Medicaid. The rate is already required to be the same. Obviously, our Medicaid health plans negotiate rates. Coming out of the gate, if I'd made a prediction, I would have been saying absolutely one of these bills is going to pass. Because what these would have done would have been impacted the commercial plans regulated by the Texas Department of Insurance. And while that's only 17% of the commercial insurance market, it's important to a lot of stakeholders. Uh, the health plans were opposed to this. They were very publicly opposed to this. They want the freedom to negotiate rates. And then interestingly, the Texas Hospital Association expressed some concerns because when you say you, you're going to lock in paying at the same rate, it also means that you can't go above the traditional rate. And so it makes doing value-based purchasing difficult when you mandate at parity. And I would make the general observation that when the providers and the health plans are clashing, all the providers need to be in agreement to have any chance of success. And so when the hospital association took a different position. I think it took some momentum out of this. There were a lot of bills that got filed, um, a lot of attempts to address this. I don't think it's going away. I expect these bills to come back. To, uh, Texas Health Alliance, we're not engaged on this conversation, except to the extent that we do not want providers to be pro prohibited from doing value-based purchasing, because I still think that's part of the future of healthcare, and I'm gonna talk about that here towards the end of the presentation. So these bills did not pass. That's why there's a strike through through the line. Um, but I don't think this issue is going away either for those of you that find that issue um, interesting. Concurrent to talking about telemedicine was the discussion about broadband. Um, House Bill 5, so this was another bill that got a promotion from the speaker and was Senate Bill 5 on the Senate side, establishes a state broadband office and a state broadband plan at the comptroller's office. We are one of only six states that didn't have a state broadband plan, which meant we were missing out on federal grant money because some buckets of federal money require you to, to, to map your proposal to your state broadband plan. Um, right now, we're in our third special session, and there's $500 million of federal uh, ARPA money coming to Texas for broadband infrastructure. There's a lot of parts of Texas that still don't have um, not just the infrastructure, but there are affordability issues. We have millions of Texas that have, Texans that haven't adopted. So we have to look at infrastructure, we have to look at adoption, we have to look at digital literacy, all of that got rolled up in the House Bill 5. We also need to do some um, upgrading of broadband attachments that are on utility poles, which is a lot of our rural infrastructure, so there's many set aside for that as well. And then we are on a path to upgrading to what's called next generation 911, so that statewide uh, location improvement for finding people who are in need of 911. The bill that struck through there, and you'll notice I'm not reading you the slides because I'm assuming you can all read the slides, and I, I think it should be illegal to just read people's slides and not say anything else. The bill that got struck out um, would have added voice over IP services to a certain state program. Um, that was considered by the governor to be a new tax or a new fee, and he didn't like that, so he vetoed the bill. So it passed, but then it got vetoed. Governor Abbott this time didn't issue a lot of vetoes, but he did, he did veto that one. And some of the stuff he vetoed has come back for revision, but not this particular bill at this time. So broadband was a hot topic, continues to be a hot topic. Lots of great work being done on broadband, very exciting um, time to be in that space. And for me personally, I am the daughter of a fiber optic telecommunications engineer. So um, that kid that I showed you on stage earlier today, her dad was working with fiber optics in the 70s and 80s when it was new technology. 
this bill was really personally um, important to me as well. And then finally, from a recap perspective, lots of discussion about public health, lots of discussion about public health data. Um, they did ban vaccine passports from the government perspective. Um, we are doing an interoperability study of public health data, which I think will be pretty significant. Um, there's also a bill to look at interoperability in the behavioral health space, which is a big need because you may remember that behavioral health is not included in the original EHR incentive program over a decade ago. Um, we're continuing to work on cybersecurity. Um, lots of concerns about privacy, about sharing and acquisition of biometrics and contact tracing data and GPS. They really want to see consent. Um, and for those of you that do implementation level stuff for, for a living, we did get them to clarify that written consent can be written electronically. Although I haven't banned all the fax machines, every session we make a little bit of progress along those lines. And then um, finally, um, the data breach notifications, we, they added a, a component. So oh, our first question in the Q&A, where are 5G standing legislatively? Um, Bill, that's a great question. Uh, it's kind of a three-part answer. Some of the infrastructure that we need, we need to support 5G because 5G is not satellite. So some of the infrastructure that will be funded will support 5G. There is deep skepticism in some quarters about the ability of wireless to support healthcare because wireless needs redundancy because it can it can sometimes get a little glitchy. Um, so there's not specific support or funding for 5G wireless, uh, but I think it is considered part of the bigger package of solutions. I know some of my rural hospitals are using 5G as a either primary or a backup to their fiber line. And I think as 5G continues to roll, I think you're gonna see, I, I get a lot of questions about why are we laying fiber when we've got 5G and we've got Elon Musk and we've got Starlink, those technologies are great, but I don't think the legislature perceives them as, as reliable as a fiber line for clinical care. So um, I think we'll get, we'll make progress. Um, I guess I need to say that I answered that live so you can clear it out of the queue. Um, but, but none of the broadband work was specific to 5G at this point. I, I do suspect that that's gonna be something we're gonna be talking about in the future though. So that's a great question and thank you for asking it. Um, who is going to be conducting the interoperability studies? So we have that in the chat. So uh, the SB640 uh, study and the SB969 study are both gonna be conducted by the Health and Human Services Commission with input from stakeholders. And we are waiting to kind of see what that process is gonna be. Are they gonna have public meetings? Are they gonna ask stakeholders for input. Um, there is an e-health advisory committee at HHSC. If y'all aren't familiar with that, I can get you plugged into that. That committee is going to have a role. But like the behavioral health study crosses several different departments of the agency. So the agency is going to have to decide how they want to do that implementation. There hasn't been a lot of time for planning. We've had consecutive special sessions and everybody's focus has sort of been on that. So I expect this to be a big area of activity in 2022. So both of those are agency studies reporting back to the legislature on what they find so the legislature can take action. Um, when the legislature works, that's the best thing they can do. When there's not consensus, you bring everybody together, you study the issue, you take it apart, you put it back together, you come up with recommendations and you move forward with legislation. It's probably hard to believe from the headlines that's not how it works, but I promise you that's how it works when it's working. Okay. Um, I'm going to pause here with legislative stuff and move into the second one of my R's. This will be the shortest part of the presentation because I really just want to refresh everybody's memory if this is not something that is part of your daily work. In 2009, the High Tech Act passed as part of the stimulus bill. 2016, very end of the year, was the passage of the 21st Century Cures Act. 2018, CMS, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, announced that meaningful use was transitioning into our new promoting interoperability framework. So remember, there was the big push of stimulus money and the push to adapt electronic medical records at the ambulatory and acute care levels. And that's moving from sort of tool adoption, digitalization, 
starting to use it in your everyday work. And now we really want to start to drive through outcomes, but you've got to lay track for that. And I'm going to talk about that some more in a minute. And then as part of 21st Century Cares, we're moving into what you'll hear called TEPCA, so the Trusted Exchange Framework and Common Agreement. This is the modernized version of what we used to call the NHIN, the National Health Information Network. It's a set of structures and agreements and standards around data sharing. One of the things that I think we've learned is we sort of sold a use case of, you know, Nora lives in Austin and she has a car accident in Houston and we're going to access her medical records. That can have a lot of value, but 80% of healthcare occurs in the patient's community. So all of these changes are really pivoting us towards supporting more of that community-based care and wanting to make sure that we do everything we can to wrap around a patient, give them their data and take care of their needs. These are really significant federal ecosystem changes, all of which were in motion before we got to COVID-19. And the reason I think it's important to take a minute to reflect on that is what we now have is a massive acceleration of adoption of a lot of these digital tools. And if y'all have seen me speak before, I use this slide a lot and I use it for a reason because I love to tell the story. You may remember, you may not remember in the 90s that America Online literally sent everybody in America a CD-ROM in the mail. My grandmother thought it was a coaster. She didn't own a computer. She didn't know where to put it. She put her iced tea on it. But we woke up one morning and people were online. And they were online because the online offerings became relevant and useful to them as consumers. The COVID-19 pandemic became the world's largest pilot project. We really all had to pivot, build, improvise. Providers had to adopt technology overnight. Patients all of a sudden were being moved into new ways of interacting with their providers. And we're going to look back on this time, I think, as a really pivotal acceleration, inadvertent acceleration, not in anybody's game plan. In fact, I will tell y'all, I had some minor surgery in February of 2020, and, and I slept through the beginning of COVID and sort of woke up and the world was completely different. And that, that's a dizzying feeling. And then we pivoted to implementation and everybody just started working to try to do everything we could to make sure patients still got what they needed. We didn't solve all the problems. And one of the things that we're all going to be working with and struggling with, I think, on a go forward basis is the unmet need that has stacked up. Um, Statistics that I'm seeing is that as much as 90% of men, for example, have missed their prostate cancer screenings. Women are not getting their mammograms. We're not screening people for stuff, which means if they do get sick, they're going to find out later and they're going to be sicker. So all that being said, patients have now adapted to new ways of getting healthcare. And so before I kind of pivot to what's reaching, I want to use a couple of examples to illustrate why this matters. So one of the communities that came to me um, during COVID was the Rare Disease Coalition. And these are people who they or their family members are one in a hundred thousand, one in a million, one in 10 million with a particular condition. And they were really raving about how virtual care had kept them safe during the pandemic because they're already potentially immunocompromised on a regular day. And now we're in a global pandemic but they still need to interact with their doctors and how useful the virtual care tools were for them. That was really heartwarming. I also heard from a colleague, and this one gets me really emotional, whose husband was undergoing cancer treatments. And when the hospital sort of closed the doors to visitors, she was dropping him off for treatment, going home or going, you know, actually she was going home, she couldn't go to a coffee shop. And then picking him back up and um, he has cancer, he doesn't feel well, he couldn't always remember what the doctor had told him about what was going on or what was next. The providers, when she reached out, pivoted to using video chat telemedicine, telehealth to include her in all the discussions about her husband's care because she was the at-home caregiver and it gave their whole family a feeling of safety and security and positivity about their care that in the very early pivot was sort of lacking because she was literally dropping him off at the door to get his treatments and she couldn't physically be engaged. So it's things like that that stand out to me, those anecdotes. We also have really good data on the behavioral health side that shows that using virtual care reduces no-shows for appointments. And every no-show that you make into a show means somebody's getting a service that they need and again, kind of keeps them from getting sicker later. So this is a permanent shift. 
in the patient's expectations. Telemedicine is not esoteric anymore. It's not a thing some other people do. It's, it's going to be a permanent part of the healthcare ecosystem. What does that mean? That's a great question. And so really, this is, this is the, the, the meat, the good stuff of what I've put together to share with you today. I really got to chance, and thanks to the great guidance I got from Hope and your chapter leadership, I got a chance to pause, breathe, and think about what does this all mean? And it's not completely altruistic because I also have to think about what are we going to be talking about in the 2023 legislative session, 2025, trying to look down the road, thinking as a patient, as a caregiver, about my friends, about my colleagues, about my business, about Medicaid, what's going to be next? So what I'm going to pivot to now is, is a little bit more of a discussion, kind of my thoughts and notes on what I think the challenges and opportunities are on a go forward basis. And I want to tell you what I told Doug and Erica in the, the preview room before we started. Uh, Y'all are the first people to hear this in any coherent fashion. I've been taking these questions from legislators and in public forums for almost a year now, but I really never sat down kind of put pen, pen to paper, pen to paper, ha ha, fingers to keyboard. These are my thoughts. And let me, let me be very, very clear for all of you, and especially for folks on the call that may not have worked with me, I'm a cheerful disagreeer. You think I'm wrong, and my feelings will, will not be hurt. Uh, part of what I think is great about public policy is hearing people's perspectives. This is mine, and, and this is what Hope has sort of asked me to drive towards today. So if we're gonna reach beyond, we're not gonna settle for what we've done, what does that mean? The first thing that came to my mind along those lines is, just because we have a framework for information sharing, we have challenges. And a couple of these I've already highlighted a little bit. Uh, not all providers were included in incentives. Not only did we not cover behavioral health, we didn't cover long-term care. And um, for those of you that might be familiar with the 80-20 rule, where 20% of your population is frequently 80% of your costs, if you look at Medicaid cost data, our long-term care populations and inpatient hospitalizations are really the cost drivers, but we didn't connect the long-term care ecosystem through the incentive programs the way that we did acute care and ambulatory care. And it's, it, I want to be sure that I say this absolutely sounds like a Monday morning quarterbacking, or I guess Tuesday afternoon quarterbacking the folks that put together the high tech act. But the fact that we let these provider groups out continues to be a problem. It's why we're having an interoperability study on behavioral health. We didn't really do public health infrastructure. And that is why when we started doing COVID, um, there was a lot of faxing and batch transfers of files and FTP and that sort of thing. Really, we didn't get all the way to an interoperable ecosystem. Oops, I, I, moved, I apologize. I moved my hands around a lot and I burnt my mouse. So that's the first challenge. We didn't help all the providers. We've got some challenges uh, that we're gonna have to face up to and take on there. The second one, and I wanna spend a minute on this because this topic is in my inbox every week. So I wanna make sure that I touch on it. Um, what of the interpretations of the information blocking rule under the 21st Century Cures Act is that you have to release lab results directly to patients when they log into their portal. A provider cannot hold uh, a mammogram that has an issue or a blood test that has an issue until the patient can physically come in to see the provider. That is really causing a lot of stress for providers because they're very concerned about the patient getting the information without the context. The patient groups, however, are very adamant that that's their data, that's data about them. They are in a dialogue with their provider. They're perfectly capable of absorbing the information, making their own decisions. And the providers should, I've heard it say, be, do a better job preparing them for all the potential outcomes of their test. So that when they do get the outcome, there's already a plan in place. This is being, uh, there's a great conversation about this on Twitter that I was reading the other day. Lots of passion on both sides. Um, but right now, the interpretation of the law is that when the patient logs out into the portal, they need to get their lab results. You can't hold them back, even if it's a negative lab result. That's a challenge. And I know it's concerning for providers. So there, we may or may not have this shift over time. 
but everybody needs to be aware if you're working in the space, if this is causing some stress and some strain. Patient advocates on the other side, they, they want this. Um, I did hear a horror story the other day, and I know, I'm gonna quote my own law, my second, Nora's second law of public policy, which is the plural of anecdote is not data. However, I do have a friend whose doctor never shared with her a biopsy, potential biopsy on a mole that was negative. They didn't tell her for a year. When they finally went back in, it turned out to be fine, but the fact that they never released the lab result to her could have meant that she could have had a malignancy that didn't get addressed. It was a mistake, mistakes happen, but patient advocates want the control of the data to come to them. And that's the direction that 21st century proof points. So that's where we sit, but I, I'm gonna be really clear that I believe that that's a challenge. Third challenge, Kafka framework is voluntary. Uh, the federal government's leverage over provider behavior is really limited to uh, Medicare and Medicaid and the VA. So private providers may be in a different place and we'll, we'll see what kind of adoption we get with the trusted exchange framework and common, common agreement. Um, I'm cautiously optimistic about that. And then I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention just the flat sheer exhaustion of our providers. They are tired, they are burned out. We have serious workforce issues on the kind of practice transformation side. There just aren't enough bodies to help with the workload. So it's easy if you work in health tech to get super excited about really cool stuff. And I am one of those people. But I think we also need to be mindful um, of what we've asked of our providers and what that sort of feels like for um, them. So before I leave this slide, we've got a question in the Q&A from Michael Burke. How does the legislature view uh, the Texas HIE as part of the broader interoperability solution and role in data sharing across all healthcare stakeholders? That's a great question. So uh, those of you on the call that might not be familiar with the Texas Health Services Authority, that is our state HIE, it is a public-private partnership. They are rolling out a number of product lines right now in partnership with providers, including something called admission discharge transfer notifications that help track when people move around in the system. There's a, uh, that's a project called Eden. I'm happy to share more information about that with folks on the, offline. They're working on a project called Pulse, which is the patient unified lookup system for emergencies. This is for disasters, both to help uh, like an emergency shelter access health information, but also do family reunification at shelters. So there's a number of things that they're working on in partnership with the Health and Human Services Commission. Now, the legislature, I would say, to make sure I'm very specifically answering his question, the legislature views that in a positive way, but I would also say that we just don't quite have physician um, adoption of HIE where we need it to be. We've got some work to do in proving up that value case. And so there are there is money available to help Medicaid providers join HIEs. If that's of interest to you, let me know. Um, so I think that the view of HIE is, is positive. There are always concerns about privacy, but it's definitely more positive than negative right now. So that's a great question. Um, got a question in the chat. Uh, I am in Medicaid, also a doctor candidate in informatics. How do you see this playing out for public health, including local health departments? So this is such an interesting question. Um, local public health, was never funded for sort of interoperable infrastructure the way the state has been. And there are some sort of constitutional issues around what the state can and can't order local public health to do that we're all struggling with. So some of the legislation that I talked about in the front part of the presentation includes local public health in the interoperability discussion. And I think that's really important. You also need to remember that there are a whole bunch of local public health departments that are actually the state of Texas. And so the Department of State Health Services is looking to adopt an EHR style tool. They did an RFI earlier this year to serve the counties that don't have specific local public health departments. We'd like to see those departments adopt tools that make it easier for them to do electronic lab reporting and electronic case reporting and all of those tools. We didn't fund it. We didn't fund it in high tech and the bill for that has come to you. So now there's, those studies are gonna help us decide where those investments need to be made. So that's, that's a really great question. And uh, Lachelle, I promise I'm not picking on you or on the other person that used the chat that I'm gonna ask y'all to try to remember to use the Q&A function 
because right now I'm having to toggle between two windows to get to everybody's questions. So um, if you want to ask questions, I, I would prefer if you can try to remember to use the Q&A instead of the chat. It's okay. You're not in trouble. Your question is great, but I don't, I don't want to miss anybody. And the toggling back and forth, especially when I get all excited about what I'm talking about, I, I don't want to skip over. So please uh, try to use the Q&A, although I will keep an eye on the chat um, as well. And Michelle, my contact information will be at the end of the presentation and you can get it from folks at the chapter. I'm happy to talk to you further, especially if you're doing academic work in this space. I always like to support that work. So don't sweat it. Um, but yeah, I'll try to use the Q&A if you can um, to keep me in line so that I don't miss your questions because that would not be what I want. So that's challenge number one around information sharing. Challenge number two is the um, coming back down to earth from the hype of telemedicine. We really had up to 42% of healthcare encounters at one point in the pandemic being virtual, and that has dropped off. So what really needs to happen is telemedicine needs to become more integrated into how we do care. There are a lot of great studies um, that say that we think about one in five future visits will be virtual. It'll be higher for behavioral health. It'll be lower for other um, kinds of services. But one in five of anything changing is a big deal. So it's great that it's changing, and it's great that we've got adoption. It's great that providers are interested. Um, I don't know if any of my colleagues from the Texas Medical Association are participating today. I know several folks from TMA, like Shannon Vogel, are active with the HIMSS chapter. But their survey data says that 80% of their members are going to do telemedicine even when the PHE is over. That's amazing. Patients are interested. That doesn't mean it's, it's, it's that simple. So there's a couple of things we have to really be thinking about. And the first is program integrity. Healthcare, unfortunately, does attract a certain um, element of people that like to cheat and break the rules to try to enrich themselves. I don't like those people very much. There have been, just in the last few weeks, some very high profile federal um, audits by the Federal Inspector General of what they're calling telefraud, which really bugs the daylights out of me. I don't like that terminology, and, and frankly, neither does CMS. If you really go read the audits, it turns out that what was happening is providers were taking phone calls or faking phone calls and then billing for things like DME, uh, durable medical equipment. And uh, one of the less was in the hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars of fraud. Fraud occurs in the healthcare system. Fraud is not a thing that is specific to telemedicine and telehealth, but telemedicine and telehealth creates new avenues for bad behavior. And what we don't want is for the real bad behavior, the real fraudulent behavior, to get mixed into maybe confusion about what code to use with what modifier back in 2020 when the world was on fire. So I'm having a lot of dialogue with the uh, Health and Human Services Inspector General's office kind of saying, please understand, we do not want to see doctors who are trying to do the right thing in the public health emergency penalized for moving quickly to try to get services to people, that is different from the kind of fraud I was just describing that's more like organized crime, where people are really aggressively um, attempting to um, defraud the government programs by filing false claims. Those two things are not the same. But we do hear some concern um, from federal policymakers, Congressman Lloyd Doggett from here in the Austin area and others, oh, we gotta be careful. We gotta be careful, we gotta be careful. So program integrity is a real concern. We all have to keep our eye on it. And those of us in the business have to conduct ourselves, shall I say, with integrity to make sure that our solutions hold up to scrutiny and that we are not putting our providers in a position where they have any jeopardy. And literally my mouse just jumped off my desk. That's kind of hilarious. Um, I'm just gonna use the keyboard because now I don't trust my mouse. That's my first Zoom fail of the day. Um, let me move off of telemedicine and talk about our vulnerable populations because I think that that's a really important discussion as well. One of the things that the pandemic, I think, really drove home for everybody was how inequitable our health system is. And this is something we all know, right? But, but it's also easy to sort of lose track of it in kind of your day to day. We know that COVID-19 highlighted a lot of disparities in the system. As I mentioned earlier, we also know that access to broadband is now a social determinant of health um, and an area of huge investment. 
We also are seeing the rise of new tools that didn't even exist a few years ago. And a great example of this is online cognitive behavioral therapy. So this is um, an interactive tool that works on people's mental health issues. There's some clinical studies that show that it really works, but there's a question of what is it? Is it, is it a prescription? Is it a telemedicine tool? What, what exactly is it? Because you have to figure out what it is so you can make sure it gets paid for and tracked appropriately in the system. So some of these new innovations are so new, they don't even have a billing code yet. And that's a challenge. And that's really a challenge if you want to use those tools to get to vulnerable populations. So we've got some administrative work to do to kind of straighten that out. And then finally, I'd make the observation that our baseline tools, electronic medical records and telehealth are, are pretty successful. They're not perfect. They always need to evolve. But we've got that baseline in place. We've digitized the data. We've built these virtual connections. We've made everybody more comfortable with them. But they need better integration. One of the things that I worry about is that we could end up with a telemedicine universe that's inadvert inadvertently sort of balkanized, where patients are going to this telemedicine platform for behavioral health, and maybe this telemedicine platform for a physical health issue, and this telemedicine platform for another issue, and no one is collecting up all that data and taking a full look at the patient. And I say that not to say that patients don't have the right to privacy when they seek treatment. They absolutely do, and the law is on their side. But they've got to make sure that they're disclosing to their providers everything else that they're doing, because you can inadvertently end up with a really bad outcome if you don't have integrated care and you don't have integrated data sharing. So we've got to do a better job around some of those integrations on a go forward basis for this to make sense. And that's really, because I wanted to leave uh, some time for some more questions kind of where I want to start to wrap up. As we move into the next phase of evolution of the ecosystem, it really needs to support patient-centric integration of the tools and the data. And I just read that to you about my own role, and I think it's important. Support patient-centric integration of the tools and the data. One of the bits of feedback that I get from health systems is that they really don't want that stovepipe siloed solution either. They don't want to have to buy a tool for this thing and then a different tool from a different vendor from this thing and a different tool from a different vendor from this thing. They're really going to start, once they've had a chance to catch their breath, looking for more integrated solutions. And that sometimes is going to work through those APIs, right? Application programming interfaces and connectivity about data sharing. And some of that's going to be moving more to a platform approach so that you can plug and play the different tools into your system. So from the perspective of purchasers, this is some of the feedback that I'm starting to get. I also think as we evolve tools like artificial intelligence and machine learning, they're gonna play a strong supporting role. In fact, I would not be surprised if we end up moving back for physicians to something that feels and looks more like old school dictation, where they're talking in the exam room and an AI tool is capturing that dialogue and helping translate it to the electronic medical record rather than the physician having to type or having a scribe or medical assistant having to just type, type, type. Those tools are not quite ready, but we're getting there. Um, I think AI is also gonna have a role in sort of frontline data collection with patients. So you might talk to an AI chatbot before you see your provider in a, a telemedicine encounter. And eventually that's gonna happen in virtual reality. I mean, those, these are real things that are coming online right now. This, this is not science fiction or you know, 20 years down the road. This is, this is real and it's, it's present. And then finally, and I wish I could remember whose Twitter account I saw this on, um, I need to screenshot it so I can give him credit. I think there's a tendency to think about products or the way we talk to policymakers as or, patient or provider or payer. And the truth of the matter is solutions that are really gonna be successful on a go forward basis, they've really got to touch on all three aspects. We have a tendency to talk about payers as an abstract, um, instead of talking to payers about what they're willing to invest in. So I think it's important to have payers as part of the conversation for solutions. I think it's easy also to kind of say to providers, well, just do it, just do it. You've got to think about how you integrate your tools into a provider's workflow, or you're not gonna get your adoption. And we, I still see that sometimes. If you drop new tech on an old workflow, you don't get the results that you're looking for. So you've really got to think about all three pieces and then finally, I would make the argument that 
we are just at the beginning of the uh, consumer um, revolution. And when I see patient, to, to Bill's point in the chat, I really think of the patient and their care team. Um, they're not, in my mind, they're not separate. So I appreciate that, that clarification. Caregivers are a really important component of this conversation, which is why I had mentioned the, the story of my colleague whose husband had cancer. However, sometimes when you start to talk about caregivers, I'll tell you that becomes controversial because there's not always good relationships between patients and caregivers. And um, I've seen some situations where that data sharing with the caregiving team, it still has to keep the patient at center. We definitely want to include caregivers. I'm, I'm not trying to leave them out, but the law still kind of gives the control to the patient to decide what gets shared and when. And we do need to um, be integrating caregivers. There's absolutely no doubt. But if you don't do patient provider payer in the new economy, in my opinion, I don't think you're going to get uh, very far. And to wrap up from a slide perspective, here's kind of my summation of our situation. The pandemic, coupled with federal policy changes, has supercharged the ecosystem. No disputing that that's true. Now we need to move into almost a total quality management. I'm having flashbacks to the 90s. I hope you can all join me in having flashbacks to the 90s. Um, mentality of keeping what works, modifying what needs tweaking, and um, jettisoning, jettisoning old ways of doing business. That third one, that's really important. We cling to the familiar, right? We cling to things that work. We still have Fox Pro running in places. And if you don't know what Fox Pro is and you're younger than me, just Google it. It's old. What? We have Windows XP running in some places because that, that's what's sort of integrated for um, a particular hospital or system. Uh, we, we've got to upgrade our uh, software. And then finally, um, the final thing that I would say is um, you have to keep the patient at the center of the conversation while not overburdening the providers. So there's a balance there. Um, it's tricky, but we have more data, more anecdotes, more data, more information than we've ever had about what these changes play, how they play out. So these are the things I think are important to keep in mind. We really got adults of energy and excitement and all kinds of really cool information. It's really important once we come out of the PHE, pause, breathe, CQM it, figure out what works, keep what works, try to move away. Just because we've always been it that way, I hate that phrase. Less relevant than ever, especially given consumer demand. And then finally, again, the patient and to a certain extent, the care team needs to be at the center. So that's, that's sort of my take on where we sit, there's my contact information. Got a question in the Q&A from um, Hazel Chapel. Quality of data begins with end users. What are your thoughts about confidence on the quality of data to install trust for AI and confidence in adopting HIE? So I think those are two separate questions. So let me start though with quality of data. We have to get even more aggressive on training our workforce. Unfortunately, the people doing data entry in a lot of our providers' offices don't, are always paid well, sort of feels like an entry-level position. The better the tools become with the capture, the cleaner the data is going to be. So you're right, Hazel, that if you don't have good quality data, your AI goes wrong. You can't really do artificial intelligence on bad data. So you really do need to move to a place where the data is coming in so you don't have garbage in, garbage out, that old programming phase. I will say that one of the things that Texas has done that I'm really proud of is we built in some liability protections around health information exchanges. So if you use an HIE and another end user has put in bad data, you're not liable for that. And that was really important to drive physician adoption because there is no pretending that the system is, is perfect and the data capture is perfect. There's also a lot of case law that supports protecting providers from these sorts of errors. You also sometimes have, and this is an anecdote that's always stuck with me, for those of y'all that know Phil Beckett, who runs the San Antonio HIE, when he was in Houston, they had a woman who presented in an emergency room with an infection. She said she was allergic to sulfa drugs. She asked for penicillin. She was actually confused. She was allergic to penicillin. And the outcome was really bad. 
and no one in that emergency room at that time had access to the original test result about her allergy, that accuracy might have made a difference in her outcome. So patients, while they need to be the center and they need to be relied on for their narrative, you have to be careful not leaning on them too much to be the only source of the information because patients, just like everybody else, are human. So HIE really gives you the opportunity to do those checks, to do those double checks, to do those triple checks to make sure the information is good. And I think the other answer to the question is we really also got to invest in workforce to make sure that the data coming in is clean until we get to you know, a really AI-driven world, which may or may, or may not happen because providers get to have some choice in the way they interact with their tools. We just got to make sure that the data is clean. And it does absolutely begin with end users. Um, and that is why when you drop new technology on old workflow and you don't do training, you don't have successful implementations. And that's something I've just seen in the ecosystem time and time again that has to be addressed. So I think we're probably coming up on time. So I'm going to defer. Um, I'm happy to take maybe one more question. And then I'm going to defer to Erica and Deb and the team from HIMSS to, to bring us to a close. Those are great questions and very relevant to the material, which I really, really appreciate from all of you. Now, if I could just learn to sit on my hands when I talk so I don't knock my mouse to the floor, I would be winning, but this is not that day. All right, any other questions? All right. Lenora, it is always a pleasure and thank you so much for your continued support of our chapter and we look forward to, I know I do, I look forward to um, your, your session every fall. Um, it's a wealth of information and very thankful for your time today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Um, this Hymns chapter has a lot of firepower. You guys are super impressive. I really appreciate the feedback. If you don't know me and you want to get connected, you can find me on LinkedIn. You can reach out to me and email me. The chapter can help you get connected. Um, please know that I'm also going to participate in the Global Health Week events that are coming up. I am a member of the chapter. I'm here to cheer y'all on. I'm here to be a resource. So please reach out to me if you need something. I'm happy um, to be helpful. I love to be helpful. Actually, it helps me with my frustration with the things that I can't control. So don't be shy if you need me. And I look forward to seeing you all at future Hymns Chapters events. Erica, thank you. And Deb, thank you so much for having me. Have a great day. Thanks, Thanks everybody. everybody.